Sharpies at the table, so uh, you can put down your uh, your Twitter name if you do have one over there. Um, there's also some space maybe on the bottom of it as well if you wanted to name what kind of organization you're with or uh, are affiliated with. So that's good. All right. So wow. WTF is up with the city budget. <coughs> WTF. What do we mean by WTF? What's up, right, Ford? Yo. So what do we mean by WTF? Do we know what that means? We didn't know what it meant before? Yes, this is a great experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yay, Gord! Where were you? 
My name is Doug Bastien. You can find me on Twitter, dbast. If you want to find out anything else about me, it's on uh, it's up there on social media as well. You can probably find it over on LinkedIn or Friendster or HiFi or anything else like that. But so certainly, social media saves time. So if you want to find out anything else, there it is. But first of all, WTF. What do we mean, WTF? If you didn't think WTF before, you certainly did when you registered. What do we mean on WTF? Who is willing to be able to say what WTF stands for? Welcome to Ford Nation! <laughs> no, 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 no. It means, wow, Toronto's friggin' awesome, is what WTF. If you didn't know, what the fuck is up with the city budget? That's what we mean by that. And today, hopefully, we're going to be able to find that out. We're certainly going to be able to inform you a lot, and this is our agenda. I thought it was well Toronto's fun. Wow! A lot of creativity in this room, and you can also see a lot more over there on the Twitter wall we have right up there. Um, so for the agenda, we're going to try to do four things. Inform, discuss, connect, and collaborate. We're going to inform you. We're going to have an infographic presentation from graphic Matt Elliott. And then, um, and then we're also going to have a discussion. We're going to have a panel up on stage. Uh, then we're going to connect help foster some of the connections here with some announcements from the community, and then it's up to you to be able to collaborate and have some of these table discussions from some of the great talents and insights that we have here in the room. So, please use the hashtag, TOPolyWTF. I know there's a lot of Twitterers here in the room. Um, and also we have the Twitter wall right over there, so if at any time you want your, your thoughts linger, look over there. We have a great Twitter wall. Um, we're taking some of the uh, hashtags to Poly WTF. Also feel free to use the uh, TO Poly to be able to link the conversation back. But it's certainly a very daunting task to try to inform and try to engage everybody here. And any of you who have been on the TO Poly hashtag on Twitter probably did think, what the fuck? <laughs> there is a lot of engagement online. There's a lot of sharing and there's a lot of input and there's a lot of replies and a lot of responses too. So uh, here, using the TO Poly WTF hashtag, uh, we'll try to. We'll also be able to collect some of the information that's being shared here for uh, for after, and, um, and and also be able to share it within here as well. I want to show you the um, TO Poly dash CA hash uh, Twitter account. If you do check, if you're on a laptop, if you check on the lists. We do have a list of all the Twitterers who are here in the room, the people who are registered. So you are able to connect with, with each other and connect with others and find out more. Um, and also by looking at that list, you can find out what others are sharing as well. So certainly what we're doing today is a big experiment, hopefully one that we can go and continue sharing as well and continue going on. Um, but it is a big experiment. There are so many things that can go wrong right now. Um, the Twitter wall could go down, Wi-Fi could fail, we run out of beer, lights go off, I don't know what, but it certainly will make it maybe a bit more interesting. But it is a big experiment, and certainly something that we're really trying out. So we're trying out a lot of different things today. And one of those is also being able to draw from this community, this community of people who are very engaged, engaged citizens in Toronto politics, and to be able to share from each other. Uh, we're going to start that off first with an infographic presentation, and then also a panel, and then also the conversations that are here as well. And this is, hopefully you also connect a lot more with each other, and also be able to build some collaborations as well. I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of innovation that can happen here in the room, and I know there are a lot of very valuable projects that are happening out there as well. So this is really about bringing people together, connecting, connecting you all, and also furthering some of the conversations that, uh, that we need to have here to be able to foster civic engagement here in Toronto. So one of those experiments is also use of Teal Poly Bar. Um, it's kind of interesting. We want to be able to keep you at your tables, but also we need to keep you drinking. That's how we're paying for the space. So, uh, so try it out. Send out a tweet to Teal Poly Bar of your drink, um, uh, what, of your drink request. Uh, we do have a list of the menu items up there, um, and also please use the table number as well. It looks like a scene from CSI as I'm just looking around, you just see all the numbers and everything, just, wow. This is awesome. Center for Social Innovation. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, so use the numbers, you also have the uh, hashtags, you also have some more information there at the table. Um, you have not only an indicator of what the hashtag is, and also what account to follow, um, and also of the Teo Poly bar. On the other side, we have the menu items, so you don't see 
hydrated. We want to keep you paying attention as much as possible, but still drinking. And I'm not just referring to alcohol. I'm not. There are other items as well. So look in that third column. There are other <laughs> items as well. Um, so please check that information at, uh, at your tables. Also, uh, also on your tables are index cards and also Sharpies. We want you to do with that as much as you can. Take notes. If there are some interesting insights that you have, um, share them. Uh, write them down. We'll collect them, and we want to be and, and we're going to refer to these and be able to. That, that's our way of being able to get input as well as also sharing uh, elsewhere. It's also kind of an old school Twitter, I guess, uh, <laughs> at, with a, with a one day delay. Uh, without the 140 character limit, but I don't know, with a Sharpie you might not have too much space to be able to use. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of the, well this is the T.O. Pauli Bar Twitter account, and that's an example of a good tweet. I know, I don't know, I've never been to an, any other event that has actually had uh, a bar <laughs> Twitter account. So, one pint of Mill Street Organic to table 42. I guess there's not 42 tables, so that's a good thing. So, Teal Poly Bar, uh, you can de uh, direct message your, uh, your request. Nadia is ready. She is ready, ready for all of these requests from you. Order a big pint, maybe a jug. All right. There are many, many ways to be able to get involved, first of all, uh, certainly to, uh, to use, the, uh, use Twitter and uh, hashtag your, uh, your tweets and your insights. Um, Another way as well, we don't want to stifle your involvement, but also we want to be able to keep interruptions kind of low as much as possible. I know everybody here is very, very engaged, but uh, try to keep, you want, to, you want to be able to channel, channel your reactions and your involvement, but still want to be able to get you some of your reactions as well. So one of the ways we could do that is we could apply the Occupy method. Uh, using Occupy, if you wanted to be able to voice your disagreement with anything that's being said, well, that's one way, and also voice your agreement. But we're going to try something a bit different. Uh, we're going to use a cue from, uh, from, from, uh, from City Council, actually. A great way to be able to voice your support, or, no, 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 it's using the Mammoliti thumb. That's not what I'm looking for. familiar with the Mammoliti thumb. Mamalini loves to be able to, to show his agreement or disapproval with, uh, with, 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 with matters. So if everybody could, let's try this out. Look at, yeah. wow, this is great. You know, I just feel so much positivity here in the room. Uh, this is great. This is great. Okay. And, uh, but if you did want to voice or show your disagreement, yeah, yeah. You know what's great about this is this is a bit harder to do. You know, this is, bit, this is easier, but this I don't know. See, like I like this method, but uh, let's say if we're talking about something like uh, what do people here think about transit? Great. What do we think about Gord Perks not listening right now? Oh, <laughs> oh. Now, now, Giorgio Mammoliti is excellent. He's absolutely excellent with the thumb. So I think we're gonna. I, I think this will be a good way to be able to demonstrate and be able to really show your support. Mammoliti is really, really good at it. This is a file photo of him at age five <laughs> using the Mammoliti thumb. Um, he, since a young, young age, this is. I, I think this is actually a model for other governments. But uh, he's certainly not the first one. Uh, it is. It's bipartisan. It's really, really bipartisan. Um, it crosses all political boundaries here, absolutely. Uh, but of course, you know, it's not limited to city politics. We also have it on the federal <laughs> level as well. And you know, Harper with the double. Yeah, that's, that's big, that's big. That is... And not limited to Canadian governments either, of course. There's foreign governments. I had so much fun looking at the use of thumbs up in government. Um, and also, I was also surprised to find out just even, uh, even in ancient, uh, ancient Greece, we had it there. So. Oh no, no, no. Oh, no. I think we might want to replay. Oh. Okay, so that's the mammalini thumb. So don't want to stifle your reaction. Certainly be able to channel that. And I think it'll also be a big help too for our panelists uh, as well to be able to see if, if you want, they wanted to be able to poll and ask you a question. Maybe this would be a great way to be able to show that. All right, so that's the mammalini thumb. Um, and it doesn't end there. Mammaliti also has their Mammaliti's thumb also has a Twitter account. I do encourage you to follow that. It's great stuff. It's great stuff. There's some great stuff on Twitter. There is. If you're not on there, 
really check it out. Uh, Twitter's got some great, great stuff. So just to remind you, hashtag TOPoly. WTF? Let's get some. Let's get and certainly get get your reactions over there and be able to share that and foster some of the connections here. All right. Now I'm going to be bringing up Matt Elliott. He's going to be uh, and people love him. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Come on. You do? do we, what do we think of Matt? What do we think? Let's let's encourage him. Let's see, encourage him. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. All right, so here's Matt Elliott. Cool. Hey, everybody hear me? Thumbs up? Cool. Who likes charts? That was surprisingly enthusiastic. It's okay if you don't like charts. Not everybody has to like charts. Um, so this is just going to sort of go as I talk, but... Um, what I really wanted to do before we get started with the panelists and with the discussion is talk a little bit about the basics of Toronto's budget. So when you walked in, hopefully you all got an infographic, which is colorful. So you can take that out and look at it. You can read it or you can just appreciate the palette <laughs> that I have chosen. Um, and really, uh, I just wanted to find some terms basic if you are like a total nerd, this might be a bit repetitive, but just so we can all be on the same playing field so we know what's going on with this giant $10 billion almost budget that the city passes every year, um, let's start with a few terms. So, operating budget. Operating budget is the thing that includes all the regular expenses the city spends in a given year. So, transit service would be in there. Parks and Rec, cutting the grass, things that happen uh, every year regularly. Uh, so, you know, also includes things like labor, materials, rent, fuel, associate program costs. And that budget for 2013, proposed right now by staff, uh, it's not the final budget, it's just what staff recommends, is $9.4 billion. Uh, the operating budget is funded through things like Property taxes, user fees, provincial contributions, but not a whole lot of them. Uh, other revenues, um, and the thing to notice about the operating budget is that there is no debt or financing or anything else included in that little revenue pie chart for the operating budget. This is because the city cannot run a deficit. I will say this again a few more times later as I talk, just because I think it's really important that we all understand that the city of Toronto can legally not run a deficit on its operating budget. A um, couple of points about property taxes that I think are important to make. My two favorite points to make about property taxes are really, really simple. Uh, the first one is, as you see up there right now, Toronto's property tax rates, the lowest in the GTA. Uh, the other point I like to make about Toronto property taxes is if you compare uh, the percentage of revenue that this city gets from property taxes with most North American cities, virtually every large American city, we rely way more on property taxes than those American cities. Uh, that is interesting. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's the operating budget. Again, let's go back. No deficit in the operating budget. It is balanced every year. The capital budget is a little bit different. The capital budget, simple definition, that is things like streetcars, subway cars, all the major purchases of things that we need for years and years and years and years, not ongoing services. Uh, city forecasts a 10-year capital plan. Uh, that capital plan is about $15 billion. And it's paid for by debt. But again, I want to point out, Toronto has a good credit rating, low debt level levels compared to other cities. Uh, capital budget is also funded by capital from current. So that would be like a pay-as-you-go type thing where it's like, hey, we have some extra money in our operating budget this year. Let's put that towards capital. And then the province and the federal government contribute a little bit towards our capital needs as well. Big expenses are TTC repairs and maintenance, Spadina subway, city facilities, and new this year with a, a big chunk of our capital budget is the Gardner Expressway. 
Gardner Expressway got a little bit of booze. Oh, thumbs down for the Gardner Expressway. Um, we'll talk about that later too, I'm sure. Again, let's go back and talk a little bit about how the city has no deficit. Because I really feel like that's a point we can make a, a number of times. The city isn't legally allowed to have one. Um, sometimes you will see people, maybe people who like work for Doug Ford, who will talk about how the city has a deficit. Uh, the city has never carried a deficit because it's not legally allowed to. So if when we talk about the budget tonight we cannot use the word deficit, that would be really cool. <laughs> and then the only other thing to say about the infographic is you can see on the left side we have this whole idea of opening pressure. Uh, the way that works is staff, sometime in the summer, they look and say, okay, next year we're going to take in about this much money in property taxes and user fees, assuming we don't raise them. Uh, we're also going to spend X, assuming we don't cut anything. And they say, oh, look, there's a gap between those two numbers of 600 million, 700 million, 800 million, whatever it is. Um, if you are, you know, the mayor or somebody, Maybe you see that number and decide to like freak the hell out and scare people and say maybe we should cut some libraries or sell off some farm animals or you know, <laughs> whatever you might want to do with that kind of thing. Um, most years, generally the opening pressure is just a figure and you can see, uh, just as I've done in 2013, staff take that figure of opening pressure and they say okay. Let's look at some efficiencies and cuts that can bring that figure down. But let's also look at things like property tax increases. Let's look at how we can use rever uh, reserves. Let's look at how we can use uh, you know, any number of tools to bring that down to zero, as we legally have to do, because can Toronto have a deficit? No. no. <laughs> Pretty sure. Um, so again, some of the ways they balanced the budget this year have been that TTC fare increase. Maybe you want a thumbs up or thumbs down that one. Um, property tax increase of 1.95%. And again, the way property taxes work is that they are really damn complicated. But uh, simply, if property taxes don't go up every year, the city is effectively limiting itself of revenue that it needs due to inflation and other costs. So 1.95%, which is the staff proposed uh, tax increase this year is a little bit below inflation, which is uh, could be problematic in the long run. And again, there is 169 million in efficiencies and cuts there, that big red zone you'll see on your infographic. Uh, a big figure, but it's about the same as we saw in 2010, which was the last David Miller budget. Um, the thing to consider there is are we taking into account service levels, making sure that we're not uh, hurting customer service, as somebody would call it in the long run. The last point I want to make about all these numbers and things is that what you see on a page like this, the infographic, all those colorful charts, is they only tell half of the story. There's a certain question of what's not included in a capital and an operating budget, and that's questions like, you know, if we could have a transit system that, you know, entirely didn't suck, it was really, really good, what would that cost? You know, what would it cost if we had you know, affordable housing that would actually house people who need it and didn't have holes in the roof. What would that cost? Uh, Childcare, what would that cost to actually provide it for people across the city? You know, and then what would the revenue look like that we need to support those kinds of things? Um, it's a tough question. I don't want to be one of those people who's like, let's just spend lots of money. But there is a question of, you know, is it right that we're deciding, okay, we have 9.4 billion to spend this year, and we're going to make all the things we need to run a great city fit into that tiny box. Um, maybe there is an opportunity tonight for us to say, you know, what does it cost to run the kind of Toronto we want to see? And with that, I will turn things back to Doug. Uh, the structure going forward is I uh, will be uh, each panel. I'll be introducing each panelist. They'll be coming out. They'll be able, they'll talk to you for two minutes, and then they'll take their seat on the stage, and then uh, I'll join them, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. After forty minutes, 
I uh, will be reviewing some of the questions that you might have. Uh, if you have any questions you want to be able to ask the that you want to ask the panelists, please tweet them. T O Poly W T T F. We have a whole group over there uh, to review and call your questions, and then uh, they'll be sending it to me uh, via the intertubes, and I'll be reviewing some of your questions and asking them to the panelists. So that'll be done after 40 minutes. Um, also, um, how is everybody's drinking? We want to pay for this place. <laughs> want to make sure. Um, you guys, are, you, you okay? You okay for drinks? Yeah, you're done. Uh, like about, you know, like about, like about. Do you want to have a second event? <laughs> so, uh, but hopefully, if uh, yeah, if you're if you're thirsty, you know, look it up. We got coffee. We got coffee. We got soft drinks. There's chips. There's even chips. Yeah, that's awesome. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. How are we doing on Tio Poly Bar? All right, there's a thumb. Great, 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 great. Okay, so up first, Alejandra Bravo. Um, actually, after, um, sorry. Um, so then, uh, then the panelists will go up, and then we're going to do a line by line review of the budget. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be so much fun. And then, and then we're going to go over the budget each paragraph at a time. We've got enough people here. <laughs> We got enough. It's only one paragraph each. It's gonna, it's gonna be great. And then we're also gonna make some charts as well. Uh, bring those together and let's see if we can make a better graph than, than Matt. I don't know. It's, it's hard to beat. All right. Uh, my approach for moderation of the panel will be. I'll, I'll just want to keep the conversation going on. Um, the more that they can engage with each other, the better. And uh, I'll try to touch on some other topics as well, and then uh, also be able to bring in some of your questions as well. So. Bringing up Alejandro Bravo at Bravo Toronto uh, on Twitter. If you wanted to uh, to address her at all, she is a manager of leadership of leadership programs at Maytree, where she designs and delivers training for emerging leaders, and actively participates in civic and political life with it with the Diverse City program at. Uh, on the Greater Toronto Leadership Program. She is also a member of Toronto's District School Board and uh, Inner City Advisory Committee uh, and also part of the 215 Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games Community Engagement Council. She has worked as a political staffer at the provincial and municipal level and has also run for council. Here's, here's Alejandro Bravo. So thanks very much for the invitation. I just want to start by saying that a budget is really about choices and those choices are informed by values. And then it's a vision document for what's going to happen in the city in the following year and an implementation plan at the same time. And clearly with the time frame that we have this year with the numbers known last week and deputations at um, City Hall next week, it's not really an inclusive consultation. And so a lot of people who are going to be affected aren't going to be heard from. I, I, just to address on the expenditure side, the pressures are always growing. Uh, we have a growing population in this city uh, we have increasing costs, especially fuel, and we have inflation. Um, it's also, uh, you know, this, what we should be talking about right now then is about what services do we actually need, what happens when we don't offer those services, who gets left out, what are the implications of that, what happens when we have this infrastructure um, backlog challenge for the competitiveness of the city, uh, when actually we are competing city to city uh, globally now. Um, so on the revenue side, again, major challenges. Uh, we're talking about the consequences of a property tax freeze last year, the fact that we have uh, a, um, property taxes, uh, the major line item in the revenue side for the city. It's, it's challenging. You get a bill and you see it. It's very visible. So when we talk about increasing it, it becomes very emotional, unlike other forms of taxation. Um, we have the larger picture about how municipalities are funded in general. Uh, the federal government continuing at about 2%, a paltry 2%. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have the challenge of the lack of diversity of revenue sources, so taxes that don't grow with the economy, um, you know, a, a big hole there. And so I think what we need to be doing in the budget process this year, every year, and going forward is mapping the, the choices that are being made, making it plain to people what those choices mean, in communities, making sure that people impacted are actually participating in that discussion and those decisions, and then identifying what uh, services uh, and what infrastructure we actually can't do without, then figuring out how to pay for it. And that's the budget process that I'd like to see. Writer and, the, and is the current city councillor for Toronto's Ward 14, Parkdale High Park Municipal Woo! Electoral District. Woo! In addition to his work as a city councillor, 
hard. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, every meeting has to start with a declaration of conflicts of interest. I have to declare an interest. Um, John Lawrence and I, who are on the panel tonight, played on the same high school football team, which is proof that if you want to succeed in Toronto, you must play high school football. So all of you are welcome. How many buses did you um, I was a defensive lineman, he was a linebacker. We were a small team. <laughs> a couple of things about Toronto's budget. Um, the, the most important thing to remember about Toronto's budget is even though there are documents this high and you can spend hours and hours peeling that onion back, actually you can spend an entire lifetime peeling the onion back, the most important and most fundamental truth is that we are among the richest people who have ever lived. Right. And we can afford to do just about anything we want. Yeah. Right? And we have to be smart about it. We have to be able to articulate why the things that we want to do matter. We have to be able to persuade all of our fellows, citizens and, and residents here in Toronto, that it's worth paying for to achieve those goals. So yes, a budget is a highly technical, extraordinarily complex and very difficult brain grinding process. But the most important thing is, it's a way for all of us who believe in some forms of justice and some forms of investing in each other to have to launch that conversation in the city of Toronto. That's what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. Okay? Thank you, Gore. John Norris is a Toronto journalist and author. He writes regularly about politics, urban affairs, and business for the Globe and Mail, Walrus Magazine, Canadian Business, and Reader's Digest Canada. John Lawrence also contributes a widely read municipal politics column each week for Space in Toronto. He has written three books, including The New City, which was selected as a Globe and Mail Best 100 book for 2006. John Lawrence. Thank you. Um, I'm not subject to the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, but, uh, <laughs> but I am subject to the laws of accuracy, and I, I did not play line, linesman, I was a wide receiver. <laughs> I saw one shift. Um, okay, so I wanted to um, just put um, this year's budget in, a, in just a very brief historical context, which I think is relevant because it's a, it's a somewhat different exercise that we're, we're presented with this year. Um, so I went back and looked at budgets, which is what you get to do when you're a journalist. Um, and I was looking at what we had in terms of the beginning shortfall um, from the period of 2006 to last year, which is uh, Mayor Miller's second term and the first part of, um, the first part of Mayor Ford's term. Um, and the, the, uh, the opening shortfall, for those who aren't familiar with the budgetary jargon, is the, is the, the, kind of, it's the ask, what the, uh, what the civil service uh, thinks is necessary, and then it's sort of negotiated down until you get to zero. Um, and between 06 and, um, and 2012, the average, uh, and I actually, um, for, in a really nerdy way, did this on an uh, inflationary adjusted basis, the average shortfall opening uh, shortfall for the period of 06 to 12 was $739 million uh, in uh, inflation adjusted 2012 dollars. Um, this year we're looking at um, an opening pressure of $465 million, which um, the city, as Matt described, is sort of riddled down to almost zero subject to what the police budget, what happens with the police budget. And so the question um, that occurs to me is, is what, and I think what people should be thinking about is what's different about this budget? Why is there, why, why is the, the budgetary pressure less? And part of it is because of the, you know, the cost cutting that was done, um, you know, over the last couple of years. And, you know, you know, we could ask, I mean, did, did Mayor Ford achieve what he set out to achieve and sort of rein in the city budget? Um, there, I mean, there are other questions that we should ask and which sort of follow from the mandate that he, um, and the argument that he and his supporters presented, which is that the city budget needs to be brought under control in some way, and then we can begin to reinvest in the city. And so I think that um, you could argue that we have arrived at that point. Um, and so the other thing that I think is worth looking at um, with that question is, you know, where do we get our revenues in Alhambra? Um, and Gord touched on that, but I think it's a, a subject that is worth looking at. Um, and when you compare the sources of revenue that the city relies on, um, 
now, this year, compared to six years ago, it's almost indistinguishable, uh, which is really interesting. We've added the municipal land transfer tax. We added and then subtracted the uh, vehicle registration tax. But for the most part, the city still relies very heavily um, on property tax. It's 41% of the total revenue. Um, and the uh, um, and then there's a sort of a mishmash of other things. And so so you know so Mayor Ford famously uh, argued that the city doesn't have a revenue problem, has a spending problem. And you know maybe now the, we can say okay, well spending has been brought under control, but maybe we have to look at the revenue side. And so if you look at the revenues um, and you co contextualize where the city of Toronto is vis-a-vis -vis its major source of revenue, which is property taxes relative to other major cities. I mean, we, we act like a small city that doesn't have a lot of infrastructure. And if you, you, know, if you make some comparisons to other uh, municipalities um, across the country and in the GTA, I mean, our property tax rates um, rise really at a small fraction compared to what other municipalities uh, are doing. You know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent property tax increases. I'm a homeowner, I'm not crazy about paying more for property taxes, but we live in a big complicated city with lots of aging infrastructure and lots of services, and so we have to absorb these costs. And then the last point I'll make, and this is something that we can talk about later, is, um, is this is a point that Alejandro made, which is um, that, that city budget making is about choices. And so the major, uh, the, the major change, or one of the major changes that I noticed in the current budget proposal is a, is a, I think it's a $123 million reduction in the um, housing and shelter uh, uh, budget line item. Michael Shapcock wrote about this cut quite eloquently in the paper in the last couple of days. Um, but if you, if you put that figure into context, that's a 4%, um, uh, that's equivalent to 4% property tax hike. So what that represents is a shift of, of it, it, it shows that uh, the homeless people who are uh, waiting for affordable housing are bearing the brunt of uh, a property tax, uh, an artificially low property tax. So I think that this is a convers the conversation about where the revenues come from is a really important one, especially now that the budget, the opening budget pressure seems to be much more subdued than it has been in previous years. Thank you, John. Starts. <laughs> <laughs> we sat beside each other on the board of health, and it was always a, uh, Alejandra's um, one of the people who persuaded me to run for city council in the first place. So okay. thank you, Alejandra. John did not. <laughs> so, Gord, just wanted to ask you about uh, also where you were before as well. Uh, what the fuck is up with the city budget? Um, okay. So, what is up with the city budget? Here's my version. Um, when the city amalgamated, we were dumped with about $750 million a year worth of costs that we had no way to pay for. And then Mel Lastman froze taxes for three years, which the current value is $250 million. So it's a billion dollar hole we had to fill every year. And it's misery. I sat on the budget committee for four years. It's just misery trying to figure out how to find a billion dollars in either tax increases or service cuts every year. Um, we've dug our way out. A third of it from uploading back to the province, uh, a third of it through the land transfer tax, and about a third of it through cuts that Shelley Carroll and I and Joe Mahevic and Kyle Ray had to miserably slog our way through over four years. Since then, almost nothing has changed is that, except that I can no longer get a sandwich at City Council. Um, and uh, that we're now selling some uh, affordable housing to pay for a phantom debt that we don't really have. Um, that's what the fuck is up with the city budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, comparing it to other cities, uh, how is Toronto's situation different? I'll ask you, John. Um, certainly Toronto is different from other cities across Canada. Um, does that make it a lot more complex? Well, I mean, one of the things that, that's different is age. Right? Toronto is a city where a great deal of our uh, infrastructure was built, um, you know, in the post-war, immediate post-war period, and it's getting old, and it needs to be it needs to be maintained. And that's that's a very substantial um, line item on the city budget. And, I mean, the city the council has to approve a lot of borrowing, 
and the borrowing has an interest charge. And so, so that, and, and you know, when politicians sort of, you know, they complain about the debt levels and they complain about the size of the capital budget, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of ignoring a reality that's not a political, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a function of political choices, it's that those apartment buildings that belong to Toronto Community Housing and that road and those sewers are just old and they're getting older and they need to be maintained. And so that's a very big piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, TTC capital budget, it's a huge chunk. Um, so these are the things that, and so there are other cities that are newer that don't have, you know, the complexity of infrastructure that Toronto has. And so that's one of the big points of differentiation. And also, I'd like to hear about the role of citizens as well. Alejandra, I'll ask you, what is some of the reaction of some of these social services as well as also citizens that are out there? Uh, what, is their, what is their role with this budget and how are they reacting? Well, I'll start with the work that we do uh, with civic literacy training. So we've been uh, training uh, leaders embedded in communities that are highly diverse uh, with a high proportion of low income in Peel, in York, and the City of Toronto. Um, in North Scarborough, in Parkdale, et cetera. And, you know, we've been doing civic literacy training explaining how, for example, how the municipal budget process works, and people are really surprised when they hear that the city can't legally have a deficit, so they said it. Um, but it's, it's really incredibly unhelpful when um, the, the process of budget making is full of useful myths in the, in the public because of what politicians say about it. So we're, you know, we're having these workshops and at the same time important people in the administration are saying that in fact they have resolved the deficit issue. So there's a lot, this larger problem of misinformation. But secondly, um, the engagement time frame now is like from the day the numbers are known to when people can have their say is seven business days. Um, we have people that we've trained that are mobilizing others. I'm thinking through the Scarborough Civic Action Network, at U Unison Health is doing it, Park is doing it in Parkdale. Um, people aren't going to be able to meaningfully talk about how these things impact them. And, and the problem is that when we talk about flatlining budgets, we're really talking about doing more with less. And that means that people aren't getting the services that they need. And this is a, a, a challenge of to explain and to mobilize people, not in a partisan way, we're a foundation, but uh, to speak in their own interest about what it is that they need to be able to be fully integrated into society and to succeed. In your view, is the process broken? I, I think that we have so much to learn from other cities. You know, uh, the Wellesley Institute just uh, published a paper earlier this fall where they recommend four models that the city could look at. Uh, the city of Calgary uh, talked to people about what it is that they wanted to see, but also consulted about the process of consultation, and there were multiple entry points to give feedback. Um, in New York City, there's, uh, there's oversight into the budget process because it is so complex, uh, as it would be in the city of Toronto, where we're both a region, we're, we're not a, sing a single-tier municipality, unlike York and Peel, where you have the social services at the region and, and the, um, the local services at the city. Um, in Philadelphia, civic groups are engaged to do budget literacy training and they're consulted around giving policy insights about what the budget consequences are. And in Chicago, they're doing this mapping of choices piece plus uh, participatory budgeting in one ward. So we're really, um, I think that it is broken if the people that are most implicated in these decisions are least likely to be able to participate in them. Well, uh, Josh Matlow and also Shelley Carroll's, uh, they've also done participatory budgeting, or at least they exercise in their words. Um, Gord, is the process broken, and is participatory budgeting something you'd be willing to consider? I'm having an out-of-body experience. Um, the process is fundamentally broken. Uh, in, 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 I, I guess the, the main thing that's wrong with it is... Um, as I said, we we we, we start the, the the amalgamated city started in a deep, deep, profound hole. So the cultural, the the, the the political culture and the civil service culture in the city of Toronto around budgeting, which is really all of us deciding what we want to do with our money together, right? Um, is oh my God, it's so fucked that a bunch of professionals have to sit in a little room and scream at each other um, where you can't see them. I mean, you think we're bad when you can see us? Um, about this, you know, this is broken, that's broken, we have to find this money, we can't find that money, no one... 
And, and then, out of that comes a, a thousand page long document that nobody can read. And then you get two weeks to, you know, not read it and tell me how I should change it. And I don't see what part of that works. If someone can explain that, I'd like to know. Is there a part of that work that, that, that works, John? Uh, certainly you've, you've seen it other ways to be able to do that. Would, would you have a different process that you would suggest? And is there something about the current process that actually works or is, is intentional? Well, I think that, um, I mean, I think I see certain gaps. Uh, the the um, 50% of the population in the city are tenants. Um, tenants don't see a property tax bill, so they're not engaged at that level. As a homeowner, I get a property tax bill. I look at the number, I think, oh my God, how am I going to pay for this? And so that that right there is a level of engagement that a lot well, of people you do in the not. city... Well, you can pay your property tax bill. Uh, no, I can pay my property tax There you yeah. go. But, but, <laughs> but it's a point of engagement. My point is that a lot of the people who are directly impacted by the decisions that council make may not see their municipal property tax bill. So, you know, take the housing and shelter budget, right? That, that you know, and that, that also coincides with the uh, group of uh, residents of the city and citizens of the city who uh, vote less than, than homeowners vote. Uh, so, so that's a missing piece, right? So that, you know, so the city, and this is not a, I mean, this is not an original insight. The city needs to find better ways to directly engage tenants. Um, and now, the other thing I would say about the uh, about participatory budget making is that in the first year or two, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, of the Miller administration, that was done, and it was it was very successful. I sat in on a bunch of those sessions, and they were quite uplifting. And you know, you did get people involved and engaged. There were a lot of sessions like this in all sorts of all parts of the city, and then it stopped. And um, it stopped, I think, because it was cumbersome and because I think the administration felt that they'd gotten all the answers that they needed to get and they didn't need to get more answers. And so, um, so it stopped. And, um, you know, whether that's the right model or whether um, a more sort of, um, you know, uh, a model that involves, you know, more social media and other types of entry points, I don't know. But I, you know, the, you know, the waiting all night to sit, speak for three minutes model is not a good model. Talk a bit about, uh, well, can I, you know, I think what, what John just raised actually is in, in, in Toronto social history is a critical thing. The first two years of Miller's administration, he did these listening to Toronto sessions, right? And they came up with uh, the two things that Torontonians really wanted were better air and transit. And the municipal government invested heavily in those for a number of years. Um, what broke it what broke it is when we were trying to figure out how to make the money actually work, because what we were bringing in wasn't good enough to pay for what people said they wanted. And it was actually the fight about the land transfer tax, I think, and the vehicle registration fee across the city that meant that if you, if you asked a bunch of people to come to a meeting like this, um, within 15 minutes, there would be the you know, Toronto Taxpayers <laughs> Coalition folks over there and... Um, I don't know how to describe the rest of us over here. And we would just shout at each other, right? So it broke down. It broke down over who pays. That's what I think happened, John. And, and the City of Toronto Act didn't resolve a lot of those questions. I mean, because the, the City of Toronto says, Act says the city may levy these taxes except, and the list is so long. Like, if you, you're talking about other cities, our Nordic countries, 80% of their revenues come from income taxes. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of taxes that actually grow with the economy. We don't have a hotel tax. We don't have a percentage of, of a sales tax. So we're actually not bringing in the money needed. And then there's the question, I think, of that you raised, one of you raised in your long comments earlier. Um, just kidding. <laughs> just you, John. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, no, what John was saying is so true around, and, and what Gord was saying around feeling that, the public feeling that there's legitimacy in the process, and um, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives did polling in British Columbia recently that showed that people um, in BC, especially young people, were willing to pay more taxes, but they didn't trust government or politicians, and so one of the conclusions was that, that they had to be dedicated taxes. But also, if, if there isn't enough money for the social services that the public may want or want more, 
isn't it difficult to be able to find out from the citizens, or also from citizens, to be able to make the case of where more revenue is going to come from without saying how it's going to be attached or what it does get attached to? Is that a difficult, at least with your involvement with Matri? Yes, I think that people have a, nobody, I mean, the instinct is people are presented with a stark choice, pay more, and at the same time the service is being discredited with stories about waste, whether they're true or not, that's not a good combination. And I think actually one of the problems we have is a framing problem around not constantly talking about population growth. So per capita, what are we spending? So that you look at Parks and Rec, a budget increased X million dollars, oh no, but actually there's the, you know, the, the need to serve so many more people, um, more seniors, more young people, that actually, if we could frame things around what we had, say, 20 years ago versus what we have now, people would get pissed off. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll cite the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives again, just to say that they, did a, they released a great study around libraries last week that shows that, in fact, in 1992, um, you know, the, the province contributed twice as much as it does now at 6.2%. $800 million of cumulative cuts, but at the same time, you know, the increase of the usage is amazing. It's, it's more popular than the top 10 entertainment destinations in the City of Toronto combined, with 25% fewer staff. So less, doing less with more is a constant thing, and if you could tell people that, I think they'd understand it. You know what, I think the interesting, here, here's the really interesting thing about that. Yes, a hell of a lot more people go to our libraries. Biggest, look, best, best used library system in the world, and it, it is packed. I, uh, I, I keep my constituency office in, in my local library. When I go in, it is just jammed. It is choked with people. It's unbelievable. Way more than the, the people you'll see at our major facilities. Here's the interesting thing. Who's in our major facilities and who's in our libraries? And that's why the money works differently. Anybody who tells you that this is all just very neutral and very cool, we're trying to decide, you know, do we want to spend money, more money on, I don't know, the gardener, or do we want to spend more money on uh, recreation services, is failing to tell you that it matters who's those services for and who has a voice. We are still, we are still a racist society and we are still a classist society. And that, more than anything, fun functions in terms of how we do our budgeting. I, uh, I want to pick up on something Alejandro said, which is that the um, board as well, that the, the city budget document is like really a singularly unhelpful piece of writing. Um, it, it, it's, you know, I do a lot of business reporting, I read a lot of annual reports, and and you know disclosure documents and it, it's it's an exceptionally opaque document even compared to other municipalities and I think one of the challenges that the city could you know and, and the council could you know take up is how to you know how to create a document that tells us more about how to, gives us a better sense of the time element you know trends over time gives us a better sense of the you know the per capita Im impact about who's using what um, the um, and just the presentation, and I, I think that this is really a big engagement piece because because it's a it's such a technical document that it precludes an effective um, interpretation by 99.9% .9 of the population, and that right off the bat you're not getting you're not reaching people. Well, I, I, I go even further. I don't think there is anybody. I don't think you say there's you know 0.1% of the po of the population can read that document. No. Nobody can read that document, and I think it's deliberate. I think it's deliberate. The, I, I adore public servants. I think they're fantastic people. They've chosen to spend their life doing things to help others instead of doing things to get rich, right? Good on them. But think of the circumstance they're in. Right now, they have to write a document that um, they can sign them professionally, right? They're chartered accountants signing this and transportation engineers signing this. Their prof pro professional credentials are on the line. So it has to be honest. It has to be honest and it has to persuade Rob Ford and it has to persuade Mike Del Grand and it has to persuade me and it has to persuade you. Eh, he doesn't always use the E. And quite frankly, 
um, given the fact that the, the, you know, the Toronto Sun also has to be persuaded, <laughs> these people are given a job that no human being can do, which is to write an honest and accurate accounting of where we're going to spend the money in a way that Rob Ford and Gord Perks will not be able to destroy them. And there is no person who can do that job. So we have a political problem in terms of how our conversation works for the, how the information is, is given out publicly about what decisions we need to make. Uh, just to go back to the question about being business-like in the reporting of what we're, what's actually happening, I think that it's important for people to understand the cost-benefit of things. Invest a dollar in childcare, you serve, you save like three to seven dollars, depending on which study you're looking at. The TD Bank just said it, so it's got to be true. Um, you, you know, student nutrition programs talking about expanding that. There is no single more important public health investment, in my point of view than in giving a kid a meal at school. Like the payback long term is phenomenal. So if we could actually have these decisions put into context, and I think that this is where, like the Philadelphia example is so ex exciting because we have experts across, you know, in society that can, can contribute and enrich that dialogue by saying, yeah, these are the policy impacts of what you're proposing to do or not do, and that you're gonna pay now or pay later. Um, I, it, you know, when we the problem I think is that the budget and now and before, um, sorry, Gord, but it's a, the, the idea that we got it under control. We're going to come and save this process. There was a hole, but we fixed it because we're super people. It, it it really needs to be de depoliticized, and the partisanship needs to be taken out of it. I think it only contributes to people's sense of alienation and cynicism about politicians and politics when it's so partisan. Okay, so... Uh, uh, you're wrong. So my challenge to Gordon and to his colleagues on council would be, why don't you um, establish a process to really change the way the budget information is presented? Use it, you know, uh, and I'm not saying, you know, have it done by next fall. Take your time, uh, look at, you know, the, the best techniques that are used in, you know, graphic design now and in, in you know, in, in graphic representation of data and say, by the beginning of the 2014 term, uh, we'll bring to the people of Toronto a, a document that you can actually read. And, um, but I've never seen that. You know, I've been covering City Hall for a long time. And the, the budget documents look the same now as they did when I started in 1995, which does not speak well to the, the fact that, I mean, it's stuck in a rut. And I've never seen this initiative come out of council. So, and I, why not? Um, we, we tried. Yeah, it's my fault. Um, I, I should, um, while we're on the disclosure thing, I should tell you all that I phoned Matt Elliott last night, and I said, Matt, there's this thing about how they're hiding this money from the operating budget, and they're not transferring it properly to the capital budget. It would take a while. And I, and I said to Matt, can you think of a graph that explains that to people? So I'm waiting. <laughs> All right, Matt, the $1.2 billion, right? You're giving me a graph. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree, but, but I, I, there, there, are, there are several pieces, okay? So this one's going to sound ugly and bad, so get ready to put your thumbs down. I don't think our financial literacy in Canada is very good. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I, when, when, I, when I go to a town hall in my neighborhood and I, I talk about why it makes sense for the City of Toronto to debenture instead of going to a bank and borrowing at their rates, everyone thinks I'm crazy. And that's just wrong. So I think there, I think there is a, I think one of the things that we have to do um, both through our school system and also politically is invent, invest a bunch of resources saying you, you are a member of this polity whether you're a citizen or a resident or whatever and we do things democratically here and that actually demands that you learn certain stuff right so you have to learn about if you're paying for a 20 year asset maybe you don't pay cash and there's a good reason for that so there are pieces like that John that I think make the budget difficult to read 
And but you can, you can aid that process by creating a readable budget. And we'll, uh, well, I don't know. If someone doesn't know I'm what gonna, the venture means, then, it, then, then you can't board. make a region, readable budget. You just can't. You can't tell me that in, you know, in Brazil and in, or in, in other parts of Latin America, people are so much more you know, literate in terms of finance. I was hoping. No, no, I think that the reality is that if you set the intention that this, that if we say the budget is everything in the sense that it actually sets out what we will do, what we won't do, who gets left out, then once you make that decision, you make it happen, and then you can draw on the resources of civil, like civil society and civic yeah, groups I, I, that could well, be supported. Well, okay, if you're going to say but Brazil, I think, no, I, okay, wait, no, to be fair, Right? Everyone always says, oh, Brazil, they have this participatory budget. It's also very High exciting. It's literacy. 1%. It's 1% of their budget. I, okay? I, I, I want better than that. I want the folks in this room, I want the folks in this room to be saying, to, to, to be the, the folks going in, and when Mike Delgran says, oh, where are you going to get the money from when you depute? <laughs> right? As he does. As he does. You say, listen, Mike. Okay? There are certain things in terms of how you finance long-term capital assets that you don't seem to understand. And take them out and walk them around and show him that just being a bully is not how you make a budget, but actually what you do is you create civic literacy about how you plan financially for long-term assets, long-term infrastructure, about investing in each other. And I think that requires a certain kind of literacy that we don't do very well. Are these two different processes that are not harmonizable? Are we not able to combine these two different processes? Uh, or is Gord talking too simplistically or within the system? Are, are we, can we, is it, it would be possible to change the whole system. Would we have to change the whole system to be able to provide for what everybody wants? And would that be Sorry, what's the Twitter site for I want a bear again? Well, the, um, I mean, the school system, the school system does make a cursory attempt to teach uh, financial literacy. And I actually wrote an article for Walrus about this. There's a, there's a, there's a financial literacy officer of Canada. <laughs> yeah. uh, appointed by one Jim Flaherty. But, uh, but I don't think that, I, I think that, I think it's a, you can't sort of say, um, you can't say, okay, well, we have to wait until everybody understands what the word debenture means before we embark on this process. And, you know, I mean, there, even in the private sector, dare I say, um, there's far superior, um, uh, you know, clarity around po about financial disclosure. The, the City of Toronto's financial documents are uniquely horrible. And, and please tweet that. I mean, you know, I have a math degree. I have trouble reading them. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I don't think that we can postpone into a hypothetical future where everybody understands what Board Perks is talking about for uh, everybody. To... <laughs> the reality is that. Actually, it... no, the difficult future is when Gordon Perks understands what everyone else is talking about. <laughs> the truth is that we have to make the process accessible. People have to deal with their, you know, they have to balance their budgets at home. And when we've done this training, um, just to explain this this question about deficit, no deficit, an operating budget is what you use to buy your groceries, and you know your capital budget is what you. No, use you know to what? I have to stop you there. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of that. I'm sick of. I'm sick of it because I have to listen to our budget chief do it all the time. A city is not the same thing as a household budget. It is just not the but same it, thing. But the problem is because that in you a have household to budget, in a household people. budget, I am not being asked to figure out what my responsibility to the person next door and across the street is. And as long as we rely on that metaphor, what we're doing is continuing the political atomization of us as economic actors in our culture. And it's wrong and it's fucked and I won't be part of it. There we go. I'm in the right crowd for a change. Okay. Okay, good. No Georgio here at all. The, the problem with, with that is that we're talking about bringing the people that are most affected by the decisions into the tent. And and you're saying that... Okay, Actually, so you're you know describing what? I don't the buy problem. that either. You're describing the problem, but you're not identifying the solution. And and the reality is that in, in this moment, we have seven days for people to try to understand this impenetrable document to rely on people in civil society to explain it. So Wellesley Institute, Social Planning, Toronto, whatever it is, are, they're providing the analysis. 
and then trying to relate it to their daily lives, my bus route, my uh, community center, my child care arrangements, and then make their voice heard. Because in the end, the way that our system works, it's ward level pressure on an individual counselor. And if we're gonna wait for everybody, for a percentage of people in every single ward to understand these sophisticated questions that you're raising, then we're never gonna develop the political pressure that is required at the ward level for counselors to be responsive to the citizens that they serve. And in particular, where there's a lot of people that are of low income, that are newcomers, and they have just as much right to have access to this process as anyone else. And if it is different, if the process is different, would we have a lot more issues or would we be able to alleviate those? Uh, some of the issues that have come up regarding the budgeting is the Gardner Expressway as well as also the, the police budget. Uh, John, I want to ask you, uh, how would that discussion be different if we do uh, resolve the, proce uh, the process that the budget takes? Well, I think that if you had, if you were able to communicate about what's involved with the budget more clearly, you arguably might have an even more complicated uh, conversation that would take place because more people would be engaged in it. Uh, like the, the problem with the whole budget process um, debate is that is this notion that at some point everybody will like there, some massive sort of consensus will form and that we can all get behind it. But that never happens. That has to be worked out by brokering on the floor of council. And, um, and you, you get something that nobody's completely happy with, which is by definition a compromise. But I think that the, you know, um, having, having more voices come forward from communities that haven't been uh, outspoken about their issues is a good thing, because that gives people like Gord and more importantly the people on the other side of the aisle something to think about. Is the opening pressure tilt the discussion to... Oh, the opening hey, oh, pressure, the opening pressure, yes. The opening pressure on Pluto. It's nonsense. No such thing as the opening pressure. Just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> the opening pressure, I'll tell you what the opening pressure is, all right? What the opening pressure is, is the city manager and the chief financial officer have to persuade a group of 44 councillors and a mayor to do very difficult stuff. Right? It's really difficult. It's difficult to go into your neighborhood and say, guys, out of the library, we're going to lose two hours. That's a hard thing to do. So what the opening pressure is, is their way of saying, just how much do we have to terrorize the uh, politicians and the news media in order to get them to cut the two hours of the library? That's all the opening pressure is. It's fiction. Oh, you have to do that. But also looking Shelly and I, there's Shelly Carroll. We had to suffer through the opening pressure. It's awful. It's a lie. <laughs> the um, well, I think that I mean the the opening pressure is the opening pressure is um, you know is a, is an extrapolation of where current spending trends are going um, relative to where the you know where the city wants to end up. Um, so. It's a, I mean, it is, it's a, it's a bureaucratic fiction in the sense that it's the, no, it's as I said, it's the ask. Fiction. What? It's a media fiction. It's a media you fiction. You guys obsess over it. <laughs> so I'm hearing that John Lawrence is responsible for the opening pressure, everybody. He reported it over, I would say, John, it's not true. And he would write down 774 over and over and over. <laughs> I'm going to let you continue, but I, do, I was going to say this earlier, that one of the difficulties that the City of Toronto faces is that it's in the largest media market in the country with a de great degree of scrutiny. I mean, if you look at the, at the uh, press gallery at Queen's Park, it's tiny and it keeps getting smaller. But the press gallery in the City of Toronto is where all the action is, so they have to have stories to write about. And it's in a curious situation in which you don't get the provincial stories when it's the province that tells the school boards and the cities uh, what they can and cannot do and what they must do. So continue, John, please. <laughs> well, I would just say, you know, <laughs> scrutiny and transparency are a good thing. Um, I, you know, I think that the, you know, I mean, the, I don't know. The opening pressure is like it's. I mean, it is. It's a. It's a bureaucratic gambit, and it it creates a. I mean, it creates a narrative line, right? 
Does it get more and more difficult year on year to be able to advocate for new social services, especially as needs come up and there are changes in, in society, um, and also with city staff having to project for 0% increase even despite inflation? Uh, does this get more and more difficult, and uh, how, does that, how do those argumentations happen? Well, I think it's, it's, uh, that's a really important point um, in a city where we're conti we continue to attract a huge proportion of immigrants. Um, we have a spatial projection of the high concentration of, so like it, it's projecting in, in neighborhoods where people are living with low income, no access to, or low access to jobs, uh, not adequate public transit or services. And so um, I think that some, some city departments are really responsive and nimble. And it's, it, ironically, they're using the private sector. They're just, they're, they're non-profit about private organizations that are delivering services. I think about public health and how nimble public health is in terms of identifying how to work with new communities uh, to serve them, to find them, to, to ensure that they're part of the fabric of society and that we have um, you know, reduced um, health inequality. So yes, uh, we need to talk about new services. Uh, sometimes that means not doing uh, things that we used to do and, and not everything has to be done by city staff. But we still have to rely on having a professional public service that can facilitate that. I'll give you an example. There's a, the Thorncliffe uh, Women's Committee with a $1,000 grant from Thorncliffe Neighborhood Office runs a bazaar every Friday in Thorncliffe Park, which generates work for women. It's been celebrated and profiled internationally. The, uh, I talked to the organizer there and she said, I'll tell you who's really helped me to get this thing off the ground. It's been... Uh, staff with the Toronto Food Strategy, and and those are that that kind of success story is what needs to be put forward above everything else. Imagine if we started every year with a number which was the opening opportunity, right? And the op opening opportunity was how much wealth was generated in the city of Toronto that wasn't needed for basic needs, <laughs> and we just had this number. It would be a lot more than seven hundred seventy-four million. I'm telling you that. <laughs> And we started. We, we start the conversation entirely differently, entirely differently, saying, "Okay, we're we're all in this boat together. We we drink the same water. We actually piss in the same water that we drink. That's a whole other story. We breathe the same air. We breathe the same air. We work in the same city. We shop in the same stores. You know, we we listen to the same radio stations, although not some of them." And we, 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 had, we, had, we began with the opening opportunity. What are we going to do with our resources together? Well, I think there are some things that we would start with, right? I know what I would start with in my ward. In my ward right now, I have a, a very significant population, two very significant populations, who are fleeing like oppression you cannot imagine. I have my Tibetan population, which is the largest Tibetan population anywhere outside India or Tibet. And I have an awful lot of people who are um, Roma folk who are fleeing, you know, this is just appalling. Their grandparents survived concentration camps. Now neo-Nazis are back and active in their home countries in, in, in Eastern Europe. And they've fled here, right? We owe those people something. There's a lot of work we have to do to provide their children with opportunities, to provide their children with uh, you know, spaces where they can do their homework. Imagine that, imagine not having space to do your homework. All this stuff we have to do. And we would look at that need against our open op opening opportunity. Imagine if we budgeted that way. And that is not an issue for what uh, Josie Levita, who is the, the city's budget person, or Joe Penichetti, the, the chief ma uh, financial, the, the city, manager. city manager, or any, any of those people, that is not their job, that is our job, and we don't do it well enough yet. The, the, the other point I'd add on this is that the, uh, is the city and, um, I mean council to a lesser extent, um, have two separate processes going on that are really tragically disconnected from one another. One is the the official plan and the whole development and planning process, which is, emphasizes growth. And so the city has grown about 13 or 14% in population since amalgamation. Um, it's, 
we grow. There's lots and lots of people coming to the city. There's lots of new buildings. There's lots of new residential. There's, there's more and more of everything. And this, the budget, the budget um, describes a city that is not growing. It, um, you know, if you look at the long-term planning, uh, the long-term capital budget, there's this, uh, it's sliced up, um, and there's state of good repair, and there's legislated, and then there's expansion. And in about three or four years, the expansion part of the overall capital spending goes to almost zero. And to me, it's like, it's weird, because, because the city is expanding, like not beyond its borders, but it's growing. And so we have to integrate those two things somehow, and, uh, and nobody seems to have sort of figured that part out. And just to add, I mean, we, we're certainly welcoming refugees here, but we're also in a race for global talent. I mean, p cities are competing to get immigrants that are qualified and ready to work to come here. And, you know, if we fall behind on, on infrastructure, we're, we're competing with London, we're competing uh, with cities in, in Australasia, etc. These things matter. We want, if we want to have that growth and we want to be positioned competitively, we need to have certain things that we offer. And having that sliding and, and looking at that, whether that went up one million or two million, it's, it's really doing a disservice to what kind of city we're projecting for the future. I'm really glad to, we've had some of the discussion on the process, on the structure, on the means, um, but also on the, the political element of it as well. Um, the role of politics in this, is, is, it, is, there a reason, is, it, is there a reason political why it's not more engaging? Really? Is politics stifling the engagement? Big P or little P? <laughs> you know, that, that, the question is big P or little P, right? Like, at the end of the day, it drives me crazy why anyone cares about what Giorgio's up to on a given day. <laughs> right? Like, why? Why does that matter to anybody? It just shouldn't. And, yeah, it doesn't, but it, it, strangely, it does. What the, so that's the, is that the bigger the little pig? It's Giorgio, it's the little pig. Um, in terms of, but, so what we, what the, the piece that's missing, Oh, I'm getting in trouble with my executive assistant tomorrow. Okay, in terms of um, in terms of what's missing though is frankly, I, and I, I got to say this is that you guys, you guys are not. It's your fault. It's your fault. All right, John. I'm gonna ask you. No, no, no. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that, I'm actually I have a coherent point. What I mean by that, what I mean by that is. We spend way too much of our political energy looking at what goes on in the clamshell and not enough time looking at what goes on on our street, uh, in our neighbor's home, uh, with our co-workers and that stuff. Um, Putnam, Robert Putnam did it very well. He looked at all the municipalities in Italy after World War II. What was the biggest correlation between an active and engaged citizenry and he looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different variables. And you know what the, the, the best correlate was? The number of choirs. Hmm. Weird, right? But what it is, we don't spend enough time congregating and talking about the city that we live in. We don't spend enough time arguing about the city we live in. We don't spend enough time owning the city we live in. So po it's the politics that happen outside City Hall that all of us have to invest more in. And so I'm now I'm going to take a dig at our mayor in a moment, but but, uh, but there is um, you know it's easier to cover it's e it's easier to write about you know the you know the theater than it is to write about you know how the you know cake is baked and so it it's um, and and in the last you know little while I mean we've seen a really solid example of, of how, you know, one issue dominates, like, and crowds out everything else, uh, which is really a tragedy, and, and so, you know, I mean, the budget process is not getting a lot of ink, because the mayor's various legal problems, which will continue, and, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, and so every new, every self-respecting news editor knows what the story is, what their readers are interested in, so it's a dynamic process, but, you know, this is, this is, it, it becomes a point of obsession, unfortunately. So I think that uh, politicians, left or right, need to make the space for civil society groups and, and uh, community-based organizations and citizens to make their voice heard, whether they're in power or out of power. 
and uh, that's going to be an ongoing commitment. I think that we should look at, we need to have the conversation about the revenue side, which we didn't have on the stage now. Like We need to diversify the revenue sources for the city and explain to people what that means and, and position us in, in, in relation to other world cities where you know we're, we're just not there. We're not world class. We don't have the tools that we need. If you look at the list of, tool, like of revenue tools that Berlin has, it's this long in the city of Toronto, it's this short, and we gave up one. So it's Giorgio sized. <laughs> and so finally, I would like to see whether like the budget process be about multi-year and where there's a formal commitment on the part of the city to listen to the outside groups and to look at them as partners in the process and, and Honestly, uh, to be really clear and upfront with the people about the choices that we have to make, who gets hurt, who gets left out, and whether we're willing to, to live with that. Uh, just on the revenue point, I think this is really, really important. Um, so I completely agree with Alejandra, except I would make one plea, which is that we stop making comparisons to European cities, because the Euro European public sector is radically different than the way North American uh, you know, the North American levels go. We can find examples within Canada of diversified revenue streams and within North America that are very appealing, that have been implemented within recent memory and have not caused the sky to fall. You know, a great example, the one that I, two great examples, the one that I like, uh, tra uh, TransLake, which uh, operates regional transit roads in Greater Vancouver, it has a whole range of revenue streams that were provided by the province a dozen years ago. Vancouver's happy, healthy, it's building a transit system. Los Angeles, a city that has similar population density to uh, Toronto and has you know, a famous car problem, um, also recently did a regional sales tax that they're using to build transit. These, and the sky didn't fall. The sky does not fall. Um, but we sort of believe that you know, everything has to be really cheap or some terrible calamity will fall on the city and will kill the goose that laid the golden egg. And it's not true. He said short. Um, the one thing though, the one thing, it's, it's I, I worry a little bit about this diversity of revenue streams argument. The diversity of revenue streams argument takes you down a path to, I think, where, which is basically uh, a consumer model. Right? If you're going to consume a service, we should have a revenue stream for that. It's, it's a variation of user pay, road tolls, sales tax, whatever. It's, it's, if you're using a service, we need to figure out a very special tax to get you. That's not, I don't actually buy that. I think we have a way, and my parents had a way, my grandparents had a way to pay for stuff. And this is how we built all you know, the businesses and the lives and, and all that stuff we have. It's the income tax. And the income tax is based on your ability to pay, which the sales tax is not, which the road toll is not, and it's not some weird thing to try to get away from the idea that we all put in what we can to pay for the things we need together. Instead, is to try to isolate each of us so that public services become more and more like the things you buy on a store shelf. There's a reason that the CPCA compared 2012 to 1992. That's because that's it was after 1995 that massive cuts to income and um, corporate taxes were made and that fiscal capacity hasn't returned to the province and therefore that trickled down to the city. But um, I think that, you know, if you look at something that Dr. Ian Slag at the Institute of Municipal Finance and Governance says is that, you know, if, if senior orders of government are, dis are defining how we spend the money, they're not re as necessarily as responsive to local priorities and I think that the reality is that cities are where people live now. 80% of the population of Canada lives there. More than half of the global population is in cities. And we really need to think about what place the city has now. In or should Toronto have a piece of the income tax? Well, that, that's, a suggestion, that's a suggestion made by Dr. Eden Slack at IMFG that you actually have a, a re that you actually, because also, then, then you don't have to spend the money on the collection because it would be very expensive. And, and that's what I was saying, Nor in Nordic countries, I'm sorry, in Europe, 80% of, of monies that the cities get come from income taxes. So those are the conversations that we need to have. Who should pay? Where, where should user fees be instituted? 
Um, what mechanisms do we already have in place that could collect taxes? But the reality is that if you don't bring in the money, you can't spend it, and then you have to give something up. So just be upfront with us about that. The only thing I would add is that I think that we should, there should be a way of connecting um, the type of tax to the type of service delivered. So I want to Yeah, like you're buying something at the mall. <laughs> no, no, no. But it, so I would, I, so I, I would agree that I think an income tax, a progressive tax, should be connected to the revenues required to run uh, the housing and shelter support. Whereas for other types of uses, where I, I don't have a problem with a more consumer type of model because it, it is consumed in a consumer sort of way. So it's a mix. What, what, like, like air pollution? Well, like a. Uh, um, uh, some recreational services. There's. Oh. No, 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 I know you. I know are, what you're are you say. Gord? Gord, are you gonna? I mean, if it if it increases. Universal public, free access to recreation. Folks, hands up, thumbs. Let's see them. If it. <laughs> oh, John, I just smoked you. I smoked you till the If it increases. <laughs> if it increases public trust, and it is a way to actually have this and move beyond, we have to cut things because we have to reduce taxes, and 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 if. There's evidence already that people would buy into I think into they it. win that argument because we don't stand up and fight back. <laughs> We've been winning for a really long time. I don't know what, you know, I think that a, a good today is better than perfect tomorrow. 2014, vote Alejandra, not me. <laughs> I, would, I, would just, I would just add that highways have been funded through the income tax for many, many decades. And they're not um, constructed on a user so therefore they're overused because people believe that they're free. And so um, so that's an example where I would say so okay, a let's go there. Consumer model, a user fee model does is appropriate. L let's go there. Let's go there. Um, in in Europe, they do not they do not have a user pay model for public streets. They just <laughs> don't. What they do is they don't build parking spaces. Right, so they make an art that what what they do is they make they make a public decision to invest in transportation infrastructure, which is more environmentally sound, rather than trying to price the survivability of the planet into a consumer decision you make as you stick your key in your car, which is I don't get how that works. I have a friend over here somewhere, and it just seems to me, John, yes, yes, we could try. To, to tax bads and all of that kind of stuff. But here's the fundamental problem. Where there is a lot of poverty right now, we're not providing services, are in areas of the city where people are not well served by transit. And it's gonna take us a generation to get transit to them. So essentially what your argument says is, the people who live in low income neighborhoods in areas badly served by transit become the people who have to pay for the transit infrastructure in the rest of the city, and I don't buy that. I would, I would, I, that's not my argument about transit infrastructure. I, transit infrastructure needs to be much more supported by the higher, higher orders. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, it's, yeah. All right, we'll move to some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, this is the first one, why, uh, and you get two chances. You can either reply to this, or wait for the next question, take a second time to talk. Can we just answer the question we wanted? Yes. yes. <laughs> so, one answer. If you want to burn up both in this first round, up to you. First question. Why is Toronto Police Services budget allowed to rise faster than any other budget item each year? Whoever wants to take, wants to take that first. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> one at a time now. <laughs> because Shelley Carroll was the budget chief. <laughs> Here we go, just very quickly, on the, on the police services thing. Huh. What, the, the, what, what, the problem, what the problem has become, the, um, I don't mind a beat cop. A beat cop is not a problem, right? Oh, the ways you can take that message. Um, I, I don't mind a police officer out on the street. I, the, I have fantastic police officers in my neighborhood who do great things for people. Um, what the problem is, though, is figuring out how we get around the fact that provincial law says that if the police chief feels that the municipality is not providing enough money to adequately police the, the, the city, they can go to this thing called OCOPS, O-C-O-P-S. And I, 
I have no idea what it stands for, but it's scary. And Ontario Civilian Oversight Police Services. Alejandra again for 2014. Um, and, and so we've been in this, locked in this endless battle about what's adequate policing. We have, we have held off a bunch of stuff. We've held off, like they don't have their helicopters and they don't have their giant extra evidence thing. What was that, 50 million they wanted? For a new building to store evidence in? I mean, we hold an awful lot of their stuff at bay, but the, okay, I've talked too long. Keep going, keep going, I want to hear from Alejandro. I have 140 characters long. So, uh, yes. I mean, th we also have the reality that you negotiate wages and then, you know, one, if 90% of the budget are wages, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't this administration um, agree to an increase in wages? And there is a, a, a pattern of bargaining in which City of Toronto officers are deemed in most danger and therefore set the rate. So you have, again, this tension where you have essential services, you have a, a labor relations regime, um, and, and then, uh, the municipal responsibility to deliver on that service. It's the tension about the place, uh, again, of cities in relation to the province. And that's the same, we're seeing that in, in, in other areas where, where you deem um, people essential, uh, you're gonna have wage pressure there. And really, you're each gonna burn up one? Okay. Uh, uh, just quickly on the police. I, I think that the police budget is subject to all sorts of forces that are not strictly rational. You can, you, can, you can determine how many um, fire stations you need. You can determine how often you need to resurface a road um, through rational means. The police budget is completely unconnected to crime levels. And um, so it's subject to, subject to some kind of psychological um, game playing that goes on every year. And that's why it's so completely out of sync. And you know, we'd say, okay, well, what, what do we need to keep the city safe? That's a question with no answer. All right, next question. It's similar to doctors. Exactly. Next, from Twitter, from the Twitter sphere. Uh, the next question is from Chris James Drew. Uh, it is, how can Metrolink's 2013 investment strategy help citizens in Toronto? How can we ensure it gets serious consideration? Don't hold a by-election. <laughs> <laughs> because the Metrolink's financing, the Metrolink's financing strategy becomes a uh, becomes a talking point in a by-election. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so so it you know it's going to come out. It's going to be a complicated discussion and it should not be part of the next municipal election campaign if it happens this spring. So I just have to point out to everyone that what John Lawrence did there is said that Torontonians are too dumb to be trusted with Toronto's future, and because we have an important decision to make, we should not have an election. Y'all caught that, right? It is too, that's exactly what you, is that what you said? Is that what you said? Well, I, I'm on the record as saying, uh, as opposed to a by -election. Yeah, but because you don't want people, because, because you don't want people arguing about how to pay for transit during an election. Because I don't want, I, I don't want an election in which the current and soon to be past mayor is is <laughs> derailing <laughs> the discussion with inanity. Please okay. tweet that. <laughs> okay, he won't win. That that man won't win. But I actually think this is an extraordinarily important conversation we have to have. There are some I agree with you on that. problems. There are some profound problems with how Metrolinx is structured, with how these transit lines are financed, and about how you all have been included in the decision. I'm not included in the decision. Shelley, have you been included? No, not so much. Right? They like the the the, the private sector guys are going to make hundreds of millions of dollars in adding no value at all. No value added. Hundreds of millions of dollars. We could provide free recreation to every Torontonian for the amount of money that the law firms, the engineering firms, the accounting firms that Metrolinx is going to employ 
building a, a transit line that they would just build from you know technical expertise on staff anywhere else. And we need to actually have that discussed. No, no, no. So John is concerned about the by-election debate. Wait till the um, the provincial government falls on a confidence motion. And we're in a provincial election. That's something to consider as well. Um, just to say that. Um, building on Gord's point, I think that it, uh, given the, the, the seriousness of the decisions, the amount of money we're talking about, the importance that these decisions have in terms of uh, our, our future economic prosperity, social um, integration, fabric, etc., there should be some kind of um, citizen oversight or participation or, you know, that, met, that there's a governance challenge to Metrolinx. Hmm. Well, you've each burned through too, and so next round. This question is from Cameron McLeod. Why do we think the province and federal government must give us more money? Is Hugh McKenzie here? Yeah. Hugh, Hugh, where are you? No, I'm making it up. No. Hugh McKenzie does this fantastic graph. He, he's an economist. He's an economist. He used to work for the steel workers. Uh, he was part of the Fair Tax Commission uh, under Ray. He's just a, a great guy. He does this great, great graph. I'm going to act it out for you. In, in 1950, okay, this is 100%. Here's the amount of money that the federal and provincial governments put into infrastructure. And here's the amount that municipal governments put into infrastructure. And we're going to do a time series, okay? All right, we're going to do a time series. You're today. Here, hold my microphone. <laughs> What has happened is our federal and provincial governments do not build anything anymore. They do not build anything. Nor do they provide money for operating it. And, and they don't take care of anybody or anything. And, and what, what have we got for that? What is, the, what is the benefit on the other side of that cost? Why, folks, you have to live. So the most important thing is everybody has a place to live. Right? You start there. You have to have... So tonight, it, it's going to get a little bit cold. You have to have a roof to go to, right? That, that's one. Um, two, you got to have something to eat. Uh, we've been fighting forever to catch up with uh, Otto von Bismarck, who created a program whereby every child in Germany got to eat food at school. So that's number two. And number three is I think uh, we have to create real social spaces where you recreate, where you read. That's our libraries and our community centers. Four is transit. <laughs> yeah, I'll do transit. Transit, and I think that um, the other priority that I would say is that uh, a, a better partnership between the city and the higher orders. Uh, because other the, orders. The other orders, excuse me. Uh, they tell you what to do, they're higher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, higher I, I, I've gotten into this, uh, I've, I've made this mistake before. So, uh, because the, the housing piece is really interesting because it, it combines both the uh, physical aspect and the, and the social aspect. And so uh, the, the other orders should be involved in investing in the social programs, um, not off the property tax, and the city should be helping create the, the, the physical spaces. Last question for each one of you. Can you name one item, one new initiative or project you would fund? and one that you would cut. Ooh. Maybe give you a moment. If that one, that's something <laughs> something <laughs> new you would want. Let's say you were in charge of the budget. That, that sounds like um, a question for a politician. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want a political answer? Do you need a cut one? Well, I know. Yes, yes, Martin. There's so many. Okay. <laughs> I think that the GTA, I think that economic development should be conducted at the regional level and not by individual municipalities. The city spends quite a bit of money on that. And I think that the, if, if I was in charge, if I was Mike Delgran, heaven forbid, I would initiate a process to for, spend the next two years to come up with clear, readable budget documents. Hey, that's not his job. His job is to ask His job is to listen to citizens, is it not? No. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm going to listen to citizens. <laughs> is that, 
I'm still thinking. Only one is hard. Again, I mean, uh, these, this is a personal point of view, I guess, and, and I, I feel, I'm in an awkward position because I'm working in a foundation. Um, but I think that the fact that we're, we, we should be looking at programs from a cost-benefit perspective, and um, so I would invest where we know we're going to get the biggest payback. We're the only OECD country that doesn't have a universal student nutrition or school nutrition program. Um, that's awkward. Guatemala has one. Clearly, with much more um, with m much more challenges in, in that in that sense. So, so start with the cost benefit piece, um, and and in terms of cutting, I, I I'm not sure actually. I think that what what what's happened is that we haven't been able to have the conversation about what places uh, the city doesn't have to do things. I think it's looking at where community based partners could actually more nimbly deliver services. Um, and, and maybe move city staff to a place where they are more appropriately located. Okay, so, so my cut is uh, the staff recommended budget um, put in 500 million new dollars to keep the gardener from falling down and 200 million dollars new, brand new, sorry, 250 million brand new dollars on top of the 200 we already were gonna spend in the next 10 years on road resurfacing. So that's 700 million new dollars um, I would just not spend. Here's my cut. Um, and I unfortunately have two spends, and Shelly was my budget chief, so she remember, I always had two whenever she asked me for one. My heart says universal free recreation, and my head says um, we've actually got to start uh, reinstating the, the ridership growth strategy of the TTC, which is better service on all the bus routes. <laughs> okay. Three. <laughs> Planning is three. That's the end of our panel discussion, but the panelists are available to join you at your tables for table discussions. They are available. Um, yeah, we don't have tables. So, sorry? <laughs> well, you're going to get us a drink. By the way, I'm told you all have to drink more beer. So get to that now. <laughs> so. Uh, welcome me and felt in uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> join me in, in thanking the panelists for their involvement. Right now it's going to be community announcements. Put your hands now. Where is that town hall? Where is that council town hall? And if it's not scheduled, you got to email them and make them schedule it. Because we can all go and talk to Chris and Wong Tents. Yes, well, well, Mary Hines has a problem because it's in Dentham and in Wongsworth. But you better be in mine on the 13th. I need backup. We all need backup. We need people to stand in the rooms in the suburbs and say, okay, hold on a sec. This counselor may be progressive, but they, they stand at the same pressure on property tax increases. They have the same pressure to keep your costs down. They have the same pressure. So they're not asking for extra resources to bury money in a backyard. They're asking for resources to deliver a city. So don't stay in Toronto Centre Rosedale. Spread out, spread out, spread out. 